all these things are the beginning of birth pains. Now, there are just a few things that uh, I can mention in the time that we have uh, where prophecies are taken to be fulfilled in historical events. But I will focus in particular towards the end on um, the events in Israel. And as uh, Ray already mentioned, the uh, uh, evangelicals who believe that that is one of the key events uh, connected with the coming of Christ. Next. The prophecies and the second coming of Christ. Question then is, do prophecies, and in particular time prophecies, provide information about the nearness of the coming of Christ? Historicists would say yes. Uh, when we look at the prophecies, they give us indications, things that are happening through the ages and that show us the movement of time. And some events have been happening in the last couple of centuries that really indicate that we are on track. Uh, the futurists, those who believe that uh, the revelation is really about the last a short period before the second coming. They say, yes, prophecies provide us information and they point us in particular to prophecies in the Old Testament that speak about the gathering, the coming together, uh, the return of, uh, of Israel uh, in their country and uh, what is happening next as a uh, prelude to the coming of Christ. But I think, and uh, the uh, examples that I will mention show that applications to historical events tend to be quite speculative. And often things that have been said need to be retracted because it really didn't turn out the way it, it was uh, predicted. Uh, maybe we can say that prophecy, the prophecies show a general pattern of things that happen in the world and that confirm that we are on our way to the kingdom. As we said last week, signs happening, signs of all times showing there is a progression in history and it's moving somewhere, namely to the climax of the coming of Christ. So next, I take as an example, the uh, application of uh, Revelation 9 and 10, the fifth and the sixth trumpet. Uh, traditionally, Adventists and some others have applied the prophecy of the fifth trumpet uh, to the spread of Islam in the Saracen time, the Arab Muslims that, uh, that were so powerful over a major area. And they apply the sixth trumpet to the, the Turks. Uh, and that really is a prelude to the second coming, which is the seventh trumpet. Now, without going into too much detail about the, prof the trumpets, there are a number of time periods, two time periods mentioned in uh, chapter nine of the Revelation one period of five months. And according to the day year principle, that is five times 30 is 150 days equals 150 years. And there's another time period that mentions, it is taken as a time period, hour, day, month, and year. And when you calculate a year as 360 days, then when you take a year and a month, 30 and a day and an hour, you get 391 and uh, a little years. Uh, Miller and his Lieutenant Litch, they uh, uh, made much of this prophecy, although they arrived at different dates. 
Uriah Smith in the Adventist uh, early early Adventism continued this line of exposition, and he put dates to it: the five months from 1299 to 1449, and the 319, 391 day, years and 15 days. They were from 1449, he said, to 1840. Trouble is that it's very difficult to point to specific dates that supposedly fulfilled these prophecies. But for a long time, this was standard Seventh-day Adventist interpretation. Most current Adventist expositors say that the trumpets deal with symbolic representations rather than with specific events, and they no longer subscribe to the theory of uh, the uh, Saracens and the Turks. Next. This is uh, connected with what became known in Adventist parlance as the Eastern questions. And the Eastern question was really a big thing. Ellen White wrote in the uh, Review and Herald of 1877 about a camp meeting that she had just attended. And she wrote Sunday morning, the weather was still cloudy, but before it was time for the people to assemble, the sun shone forth. Boats and trains poured their living freight upon the ground, as was the case last year. Elder Smith, this is Uriah Smith, spoke in the morning upon the Eastern question. The subject was of special interest and the people listened with the most earnest attention. It seems to be just what they wanted to hear. The end of the 19th century saw the Ottoman, the Turkish empire disintegrated, disintegrating. Uh, this caused a major end time fever and the issues surrounding this topic were referred to as the Eastern question. Next. There is really uh, little information in the Bible on which they, they could work with, but as always, Daniel 11 popped up with the struggle between the King of the South and the King of the North, and then, of course, Revelation 9 and Revelation 16 about Armageddon, etc. The Adventist pioneers were not always in agreement uh, with regard to the Eastern question. Uh, James White did not have the same opinion as to details as Uriah Smith, but they agreed that the collapse of the Turkish Empire could be seen as a prelude to the second coming. Uriah Smith wrote, 1897, here are the events to come. So it was pretty certain. The events to come, as we believe, in the following order. One, further pressure brought to bear on some way upon the, in some way upon the Turks. His retirement from Europe, his final stand at Jerusalem, the standing up of Michael or the beginning of the reign of Christ and his coming in the clouds of heaven. And it is not reasonable to suppose that any great amount of time will elapse between these events. So a direct connection there between the disintegration of the Turkish uh, influence, uh, a last uh, attempt uh, of the Turks to, uh, uh, to make themselves felt uh, just before Jesus Christ would return. Next. So this is one example of the, uh, the close connection that was seen between uh, prophecy uh, as uh, predicting as, as something that predicted the soon coming of Christ. We see a repeat of that at the time of the World War I. 
And to the right, you have the, a picture of a cover of a book written by, that was A.G. Daniels, who uh, was the uh, division, no, the general conference president at the beginning of the 20th century for as long as 21 years. And he wrote this book, The World War, its relation to the Eastern question and Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon, uh, that was of course a magic name. Uh, we find that in the Revelation, but just a few times. And there has always been in early Adventism and even until recently, a discussion about what that meant. Was that something uh, symbolic or something literal, some kind of battle in the Middle East. And until recently, that was the majority position. That is how it would end. And it would end some soon. And uh, as World War I was taking place, many Seventh-day Adventists believed that the end was now very, very nigh. And this was strengthened by the fact that uh, there was a major pandemic at the end of the First World War, which strengthened the nervousness, the Spanish flu. Uh, James Edson, his book was revised by his, his book, The Coming King, was revised by Alonso Baker. And in this revised edition, which uh, appeared in 1938, uh, the Spanish flu was referred to as the most decimating pestilence of all history. Sign of the nearness of the coming of Christ, if there ever was one. Yeah, next. One of the terms that we also find uh, again and again connecting political events with the coming of Christ is the term, the kings of the East. They're mentioned in sixth, Revelation 16, in connection with the drying up of the Euphrates, which it says paves the way for the kings of the East, and that signals the end of the world. Uh, many Seventh-day Adventist preachers connected the uh, uh, ascent of the kings of the East with the possible victorious uh, role of Japan at the end of the World War II. They wondered, will Japan uh, win the Second World War after all? Is that a symbolic representation of uh, the kings of the East? Or, and this was the opinion of several who came later, does this point the kings of the East to the prominent role of other Eastern powers prior to the end? Some have suggested maybe China is mentioned. Should we perhaps expect an end time Asian bloc prior to the coming of Christ? Yes. As we move in the Cold War, we see that again and again, the uh, uh, political events are seen as connecting with, uh, as a sign of the imminent coming of Christ. The threat of nuclear catastrophe was almost daily on the minds of the people. I remember when I was in elementary school, I must have been, uh, this must have been in the uh, mid fifties, that all the uh, students of the school were called together and we were warned by the headmaster that uh, there might well be some terrible thing happening in the near future. You know, Russia might uh, want to do something terrible to the Western world. And when that happened, well, we were told that uh, we would have to take uh, uh, shelter somewhere and uh, we were given other uh, particular advice. And a booklet was uh, uh, distributed 
throughout the Netherlands, in every home, telling us about what to do when uh, there would be a nuclear war. And apparently this was also uh, the case in other countries. As I read in this quote, those who are old enough to remember the escalating Cold War crisis in the 1950s and 1960s and the threats of nuclear war, remember handbooks mailed to homes by the Office of Civil Defense, the drills of hiding underneath school decks, desks and knowing the location of the nearest nuclear fallout sh shelter. It's long ago, but uh, many of us will still remember that, how in the Cold War, how in this period, 1950s, 1960s, uh, in many Adventist uh, sermons, uh, the topic was the near coming of Christ and a sure sign was the threat of a nuclear catastrophe. Yes? One of the uh, other examples that I would like to point out is um, the uh, attention to two rather mysterious names in the book of Ezekiel, Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38, 39. And uh, you read that chapter, you find mention is made of the chief prince of Rosh. Now you don't find that in all translations, Bible translations, because this word Rosh uh, is rather debated and that could also mean uh, chief uh, rather than being a proper name. But in many of the translations, we find there mention of the chief prince of Rosh. And to many interpreters, uh, this was clearly a reference to Russia. And there was also mention of another power, Meshek, and uh, that was clearly, it was felt a reference to Moscow. Now we find that in Revelation 20, the names return uh, in, as uh, players in the end time battle. And so this became a popular topic in particular in evangelical circles uh, in the prophecies about, about Israel and in the end time scenario, the role that Russia would be playing. Uh, many politicians, uh, at least some very influential politicians, uh, took this as something that uh, uh, was a really a biblical warning that they should take to heart. It is known that for Ronald Reagan, this was this prophecy, uh, these prophecies about Gog and Magog, they pointed to Russia and uh, that made clear where the major threat came from. And uh, there are sources that say that in a conversation of Bush with Chirac, the French president, uh, Bush said, when I look at the Middle East, I see Koch and Magog at work. So uh, clearly here was also a connection between the soon coming of Christ and something uh, mentioned uh, actually in a rather obscure way in Ezekiel and in, uh, in the book of Revelation. And most Bible interpreters really say that they don't know what Koch and Magog stand for. Yes. In the last few decades, much has been made also about uh, the uh, prophecy about a divided Europe. The basis of Daniel 2, it was maintained and preached that there are a couple of major empires, but after uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, but then uh, Europe 
the territory of Rome would be split into a number of different uh, kingdoms or empires, powers. Uh, the feet of the image, they were then the divided Europe of today. And so it was said, iron does not mix well with clay. So these nations in Europe, they will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. And anytime there is a problem in the European Union, this uh, prophecy is referred to by some. No, don't expect Europe to be strong because iron does not mix with clay. It will remain a divided kingdom. And they say, look at what happened in history. The attempts of Charlemagne, uh, Charles V, uh, Louis XIV, Napoleon, and uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, Adolf Hitler, they've all tried to unite most of Europe. It did not succeed. And so the European Union will not succeed either. The League of Nations, which functioned between 1920 and 1939, did not prevent World War II. History shows uh, Europe cannot be united. Yes? Today, there is the European Union, 27 countries, about 500 million plus people. Many people say there is a large influence of the Vatican. Well, that's a topic by itself. Uh, the idea that the Vatican has its finger in about everything. Uh, I'm quoting from a... Uh, website on Bible prophecy in their own words. The desire for the European Union is to create a more united Europe. But prophecy has forewarned us that inasmuch as iron does not mingle with clay, to form a strong bond, this union will be partly strong and partly broken, weak. And this we can all attest to. Well, you've seen in recent times, the Brexit, and from a British web, uh, website, from one of the uh, major churches in Britain, I uh, quote, I take this quote, in the wake of the UK's recent exit from the European Union, it is important that we understand how important this act is in the end time Bible prophecies. So here also a connection made between what happened in what happens in the world, a specific connection and what is predicted in this case in Daniel 2. Yes. But let's focus now for a few moments on the evangelicals and uh, what they have said about Israel. Uh, most of us are probably aware of the outline of the major political developments in the Middle East, uh, and in particular, the area of Palestine. Palestine for centuries was ruled by different powers, Syrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, in post-biblical times after the Bible times, long periods of Arab rule, uh, then for about four centuries, the region was controlled part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Uh, after World War II, the British mandate from, uh, the British got a mandate from the League of Nations to, uh, to look after this territory. And the goal was to establish eventually a Jewish national homeland. Uh, already uh, waves of immigrants had come to the area, uh, in particular from Russia after the programs of uh, the 1880s, and many waves of migration were following. And then the Zionist movement started under the leadership of Theodore 
Herschel just before the turn of the century. So something was happening there in the Middle East, yes? Uh, a turning point was really something called the Balfour Declaration. And certainly in retrospect, that was something that really made things happening. And I'm quoting, the Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 during the First World War, announcing support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, then an Ottoman region with a small Jewish population. The declaration was contained in a letter dated 2nd November 1917 from the United States Foreign Secretary, Arthur to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the British Jewish community. And he was supposed to transmit it to the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. The text of the declaration was published in the press. Well, in itself, this does not seem to, moment, to be so momentous, but uh, history books will usually mention this as a turning point in the struggle to get a free Palestine as a Jewish state. Yes? May 14, 1948, Israel declared itself independent. Uh, that was immediately followed by the Israeli-Arab War. Uh, a number of other wars have followed. Six-Day War in 1967 and the so-called Yom, Yom Kippur War in 1973. But Israel was there to stay. Uh, and at present, there are some 7 million Jewish citizens. And about three quarters of the population of that area is Jewish. Yes? Now, the evangelicals, or many evangelicals, uh, tell us that what happened in Palestine, that really is the sign par excellence that uh, the uh, Old Testament prophecies about the uh, br brilliant future for Israel were being fulfilled. Paul Lindsay is probably the most well-known author in those circles who wrote about this, and his books were translated all over the world and no less than 50 million copies, we are told, has been, uh, have been sold. He maintained, and with him many others, that the Old Testament prophecies about the ministry of Jesus and about the time of the end, they can be pieced together to make a coherent picture, even though the pieces are scattered, scattered in small bits throughout the Old and New Testament. And indeed, it is a puzzle that must be put together. The key for interpreting the prophecies concerning the end time is the establishment of the Jewish state in 1948. At that time, Lindsay says, uh, all the biblical predictions about a future restoration of Israel were fulfilled. This marked the beginning of the final phase of human history, which will end off with the second coming. Israel is at the center of everything that takes place in this final phase. So how do they see this? Lindsay and many others in the evangelical camp. There's going to be a final period of seven years just before the coming of Christ, the time of tribulation. Most of these people are dispensationalists. Uh, history is divided in a number of different dispensations, different ways in which God is dealing with mankind. These seven years are the last dispensation. 
begins with the rapture, when uh, there is the, uh, the the mysterious disappearance of uh, of God's people from this earth, they are being raptured. Uh, some of the things that then happen in these in this seven year period is that the Antichrist, whoever that is, makes an alliance with Israel, helps in rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. Many say there is some kind of world government that will be formed. But while all this happens, uh, Israel will be attacked from all sides. And this culminates most likely in a third world war, a nuclear Armageddon. And then prophecies will be, be fulfilled, such as Zechariah 13. Uh, Two thirds of Israel shall be cut off and perish. One third will survive. And they who survive, they will call on my name and I will answer them. And then Christ will set up his kingdom. These are some of the things that are then happening in this last seven year period. Yes. Lindsay uh, made subsequent adjustments as history further unfolded. Those of you who have ever looked into his uh, book, The Late Great Planet Earth, they know that uh, in the earlier editions, there were all, all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, schemes about what would happen politically in, uh, in Europe and the Middle East. But uh, many of the things that he predicted uh, did not come true and had to be adjusted. But the basic question is, is this approach to old time prophecy correct? Is this really the sign of the coming of Christ? Dutch professor, Professor Alders, stated already in 1949, this was just a year after the state of Israel had been founded. And he did not retract that statement later on. Whatever has happened in Palestine, he says, and whatever may happen in the future, it has nothing to do with the divine prophecies which we find in the Holy Scriptures. Yes? But the uh, evangelicals say, look, this is really what has been prophesied by the Old Testament, and so why don't we believe it? God made a covenant with Abraham to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. And the whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give to you, how? As an everlasting possession. And God said to Moses, Exodus 23, I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Palestines and from the desert to the river. But what uh, these uh, uh, people who propose this usually forget to mention is uh, a statement like we find in uh, Exodus 19, where uh, at the Sinai, God says, if you obey me fully and keep my commandments, then, out of all nations, you will be my treasure, treasured possession. If you obey, there is a condition. Only then will happen what I'm now promising. Yes? And yes, we know there are numerous prophecies about the scattering, the judgment, the return, and the restoration of Israel. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Okay, it is said, this has been fulfilled in the establishment of the state of Israel. And I will save my people from the countries of the East and the West. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. Though I scatter them among the nations, yet in distant lands, they will remember me. 
they and their children will survive and they will return. And many evangelicals say, this is exactly what has happened. They have survived and they are returning to Israel. However, and I repeat what I just said before, they often forget, they usually forget the fact that prophecies are conditional. Uh, there is also a but. For instance, in Deuteronomy 28, where God speaks about the blessings, if his people is uh, obedient, but also about the curses, what will happen if they are not obedient? And really Israel uh, chose often a path against God. And, uh, and God says, what more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? Deuteronomy, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down before them, I testify to you today that you will be destroyed. So that's a totally different sound. There's the warning. God will scatter you among the people and only a few of you will survive. Yep. There is this phenomenon of conditional prophecy that uh, is often forgotten. The conditional prophecy concept is based on two premises. God does indeed what he has promised. His character is unchanging, very true. But just as true is that God may change his plans when conditions change. And uh, we find a number of examples of that in the Bible. Take Jonah's prophecy of Nineveh and, uh, and this uh, uh, very important and interesting chapter in Jeremiah 18, where the prophet Jeremiah is directed towards the house of the potter and then is watching how the potter makes a particular pot. But if he doesn't succeed, then uh, he just starts anew and, and tries again. Richard Rice in his book, The Reign of God, writes, God may modify his plans on the basis of human decisions. Therefore, many prophetic predictions, predictions are not as ironclad forecast of the future. Ellen White, she agreed and said, it should be remembered that the promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. Yeah. So does the state of Israel fulfill the Old Testament prophecy? Are evangelicals correct in stating that the establishment of Israel is a sign of the times par excellence? Uh, it should be admitted that the interpretations about the future of the state of Israel, of Lindsay and others, they contain lots of conjectures about the political developments all over the world that have not come true. I'm quoting a comment by a Baptist theologian. My studies of the Torah and the prophets told me of the expectations that God had from Israel for Israel from her beginnings. But she has fallen short of the ethical and moral challenges from the prophets in Israel, far short of what God demanded of her in his word. And then he, he points to something that has also often worried me greatly. He says, the Israeli dealings with the Palestinians since 1967 have exhibited less than exemplary justice and righteousness. That's a very careful way of stating something that is unfortunately 
all too true. Yes? And the same Baptist professor, he states that in fact, the state of Israel is a thoroughly secular project, project. And the vast majority of the Israeli population are Jews only by heritage and not by religion. Uh, today, the last statement, Israelis welcome the support of evangelical and fundamentalist Christians but they're far more interested in their money and the political support from in particular the United States that they bring along than in their religious ideas and predictions about the future. Yes. This, and this is something I want to briefly point to before uh, we, uh, we come to our discussion. Could Israel, nonetheless, have a future role in God's plans. Uh, we have, as Seventh-day Adventists always said, most of us at least, no. Uh, Israel has no further plan. The church has replaced Israel. Uh, the uh, physical Israel has uh, been replaced by the spiritual Israel, the church. However, in recent uh, thinking, there has been a shift on the part, in particular, of some people who have written about that within our church. One of them is Jacques Ducan, himself uh, uh, with Jewish roots. And he maintains that the Seventh-day Adventist Church must abandon this replacement theory, this idea that the church has taken the place of Israel. No, he says, the Jewish and the Christian faith are closely related. They are two voices for the same God. Both witnesses, Israel and the church, are needed. Not only because they confirm each other's truth, but also because each one brings a truth, a dimension that is ignored or simply rejected by the other. Now, this is so far a minority statement, but he is not the only one. Yes? Manuel, Angel Manuel Rodriguez, who played an important role in the Biblical Research Committee, uh, was interviewed by Mark Kellner, How Should Christians View Israel? And he stated this, it is unfortunate that sometimes Israel has been seen by some people as rejected. The Lord has used Israel in wonderful ways in the past and the present. If you look at the scripture itself, it has reached us through the work of the Jewish people. The Lord used them to preserve the text for us. In the beginning of the Christian era, the Lord used Jews to hide the biblical scrolls that have been a tremendous blessing to us today. Throughout history, they have been a tremendous witness to the law of God and to the Sabbath. And so, Rodriguez says there are important matters that need a more careful analysis and more careful expression than they have received in the past. So he says, look at it again, because we may have been wrong to say that Israel has no further rule role at all. Yes? Well, having said that, when we look at the connection between, uh, in particular, prophecies in the book of Revelation and the soon coming of Christ, then let's be careful to make too many of those direct connections. We have all too often been wrong. When I look at the book of Revelation, I see the following outline. In chapter one, we see Christ, a vision of Jesus Christ walking among the lampstands. 
And then the prophet is told what these lampstands mean. They are God's church. And there Christ is walking among his people, walking among the lampstands. That's how the book begins. And the book ends, the last two chapters, when Christ brings a new future. And one of the key elements of that new future is that God lives again amongst us. So that's how it begins. That's how it ends. And yes, in, in between, lots of things are happening in the world. But if we read the book of Revelation, we see there that God pulls his people through. There are the 144,000. God has numbered his people. He knows exactly who are his. And together they form a great multitude. That's the good news. And the book of Revelation clearly indicates that whatever happens, a choice is uh, required. Yes. So what about politics and science? And this is the last slide. Linking the prophecies with specific political historical events and historical developments has proven time and time again to be unwise. That has been true in non-SDA circles. That has been true in our own Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And although we sometimes think that trends are clear, then if we look again, they are not quite as clear as we thought. And sure, there are still wars and rumors of wars, and we mentioned that last week. But actually, when we look at the situation in the last uh, 50 or 60 years or so, uh, there have been fewer wars rather than more wars. And certainly uh, in the period after the Second World War, the number of war victims has in fact decreased. That does not mean that wars are not a signal that something is wrong in this world, that Christ is coming, but to connect particular events uh, with uh, uh, a kind of time expectation has proven to be unwise. Science, we said it last week, through the centuries, indicate, however, that the world is moving towards its destiny and that. Christ is coming. Now next week, we will talk about the sign that uh, is often seen as one of the greatest signs of the nearness of Christ coming. The gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. And uh, I will look next week with you at some of the implications of that statement and uh, the question, are we really going to succeed in doing that, in bringing the gospel to the whole world? Thank you very much, Björn. Uh, I'm glad it, it worked. <laughs>